Right. Hi, welcome everyone to a child's Christmas in San Francisco, which is a conversation with author John Briscoe and Ralph Lewin. My name is Taryn Edwards, and I am one of the librarians here at the Mechanics Institute. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with mechanics, we are a 166 year old independent membership organization <clears throat> that houses a wonderful library. The oldest, in fact, designed to serve the public in California. We're also a cultural event center and a world-renowned chess club that is the oldest in the nation. Right now, due to the pandemic, almost all of our activities are virtual, but I encourage you to consider becoming a member with us. It's only $120 a year, and with that, you help support our continued contribution to the literary and cultural world of the San Francisco Bay Area. I'd like to introduce our Chief Executive Officer, Kimberly Scrafano. Uh, she joined the Institute in July of 2019. And um, thanks, Kimberly, for hosting with me tonight. Sure, thank you so much. I really appreciate having the opportunity to be part of this great program. Uh, just want to welcome all of our guests and presenters, and I'm sure both of these distinguished folks need no introduction, but I will try my best to, to do them justice. Um, first, it's my honor to welcome John Briscoe, a member of Mechanics Institute for more than 17 years. So <laughs> thank you for sticking around with us for so long. We really appreciate it. Uh, John is a poet, an author, and an attorney, and he's also co-owner of Sam's Grill, the fifth oldest restaurant in the United States. And uh, he has generously donated wonderful, exquisite food over the years. And I heard there was even some delivery, which is, which is always wonderful. Uh, but more than that, he's published poetry, articles, and prose, including several books. He's also a senior partner at a San Francisco law firm and has argued and tried numerous cases, including uh, before the United States Supreme Court. He's also served as special advisor to the United Nations and is a distinguished fellow at the University of California, Berkeley. John has also served on the advisory board of the of creative writing pro, M, MFA program at St. Mary's College in California. And he sits on the board of several historical societies and other organizations as well. And joining John in conversation about his new book is Ralph Lewin, the previous executive director at Mechanics Institute. And Ralph has been instrumental in helping develop a Mechanics Institute stronger partnerships and enhancing programming while he was here. He also previously served as president and CEO of Cal Humanities and currently is the executive director and chair of the Peter E. Haas Jr. Family Fund. He's also been on numerous boards focused on cultural and educational endeavors. And uh, he joins John in discussing his new bit, book, picking up a bit on the, their previous conversation, I believe, where they talked about John's book, Crush, The Triumph of California Wine. Uh, and I was just sort of mentioning that I just got a chance to read John's new book as well. And I encourage all of you, if you can, to take a look at it. It was a wonderful read um, and very beautifully laid out. And now I will turn it over to John and Ralph. Thank you. Oh, thanks very much, Kimberly. Uh, Taryn, I just wanted to thank you and, and your uh, other staff members and, and, and the Board of Mechanics Institute for inviting me and John to be with you tonight. And, also thank the audience, uh, uh, many of whom are, are members of Mechanics Institute. And if you're not a member, uh, I ask you to consider joining. And if you are a member, man, a Mechanics Institute gift membership is just an incredible holiday gift. It's kind of like a, a badge of honor that people who love San Francisco should wear. Um, so speaking of honor, uh, what a pleasure to be back with you, John, at Mechanics Institute uh, virtually. I wish we were there in person, but <laughs> so it goes. Um, and uh, Kimberly talked a little bit about your background. Um, and uh, one thing I, you know, we've talked a little bit about, but I think would be interesting to learn a little bit more about is um, your, your childhood, this is a child's Christmas in San Francisco. Um, what was your childhood like? You grew up in San Francisco, didn't you? Well, much of my childhood was, and thank you, Ralph and Kimberly and Taryn. I, I want to thank you both also for this opportunity. Uh, I love mechanics. For the folks in the audience, 
what's behind Ralph is the magnificent library at the Mechanics Institute, which is to be seen and to be lived in if you haven't seen it before. Uh, yes, uh, much of my early childhood was in San Francisco in North Beach at 630 Lombard Street. And it was a magical city that I fell in love with. Uh, then I was rusted away to have to live with my parents in Stockton. I was living with my grandmother. We boarded with a, a lady at 630 Lombard Street. Uh, and I yearned for the day that I would be free and return to San Francisco. Uh, it was a wonderful time. It was magical. The end of the, I was I'm not quite old enough to remember the end of World War II, but I remember well the end of the Korean War. And the city was one magnificent party. And everywhere, my grandmother and our landlady, Mrs. Giacomazzi, took us. I was the star of the show, and I could never figure that out as a you know, five-year-old kid, six-year-old kid, <clears throat> until years later when I realized, ah, all these servicemen who were getting ready to muster out, I'm the son they hadn't seen in three years or had never seen. And that's why I was such a star. <laughs> anyway, mm -hmm. kind of hard not to like San Francisco after a start like that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, what was North... North Beach in particular, like in those days, what what memories do you have of North Beach as kind of a neighborhood in, in the city and the place it, it held? Very much as it is today, oddly. So many people talk about the great changes that have occurred in San Francisco. But as I walked North Beach and for 10, 11 years, my office was right at the foot of Telegraph Hill. So North Beach was a quick walk for lunch. And it, it hasn't changed much. When I was growing up, um, the boundary between Chinatown and North Beach, Broadway, had, had been broken. There were a lot of Chinese families in North Beach. And, and mind you, I'm living with my grandmother, who was a, an Indian woman from Mexico, and our landlady, who was a Spaniard. She, her late husband was attached. So, it wasn't an Italian household, but everybody around was Italian and Chinese. And the Wong family lived in the building at the corner of Mason and Lombard, that'd be the Northeast corner. And Mr. Wong had, the, the grocery store was down below and they lived upstairs. And Eddie was my good buddy. And what was our playground? Well, right across the streets, the North Beach playground and the North Beach mm. branch of the library. Was right. Mm -hmm. there. So this was the whole world. Two blocks up was uh, Liguria Bakery mm -hmm. uh, with the great uh, Italian breads and uh, Saints Peter and Paul Church, of course, and Fisherman's Wharf. Not too far. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was my world. Beautiful. Were you one of those kids that that grew up uh, going to the library and kind of having an inkling from an early age that? you know, storytelling, that writing was going to be part of, of your life from early on? I don't remember that it was the library, but I do remember storytelling because storytelling was in the family, on both mm -hmm. sides of the family, mm -hmm. uh, the Irish side as well. And, uh, uh, and poetry was everywhere. Uh, so it was, it was just in me. I can't explain it. Nobody said this is really important. It just was important. Mm -hmm. And I seemed to apprehend it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you certainly have. I mean, you've been prolific as of late in terms of the writing that you've been doing and the publishing. Uh, you know, the last time we were together at Mechanics, we discussed your book, Crush. Uh, about the history of the wine industry, which I thought was a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, book and exploration into that part of California's history. Um, book prior to Crush, I think, was a poetry, right? That's correct. Um, the book prior to Crush was called The Lost Poems of Chandra. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are... I mean, nobody's listening, right? It's just you and me. So I can give away a secret. <laughs> it's between us. Okay. The, um, 
These are uh, translations from uh, ancient Chinese 4,650 years ago, which makes them the oldest known poetry on earth, older than the Epic of Gilgamesh, mm -hmm. older than the hymns of Enhodwana, uh, mm -hmm. which are about 150 years older. This is from Akkad in what's today Iraq. Um, in truth, I wrote the whole thing. It's a, a friendly, uh, a friendly literary hoax, if you will. Uh, but it was an attempt to write poetry that you can't write today. Mm -hmm. There are two types of poetry that are banned by the PC police. If you noticed, you and I have had some conversations about this. Uh, one is light verse. Oh no, <laughs> that's just. That's just off limits. You cannot mm -hmm. do that. Poetry mm -hmm. is a deadly serious thing. It's about those deep internal thoughts that one has while walking the Irish setter on the college green. Because <laughs> these thoughts are more important than anything else in the world, right? And the other is love poetry. I have no idea because poetry had to have begun as a means to try to express the emotion love in all mm -hmm. of its infinite facets. But when's the last time any of us read just good old fashioned love poetry in Poetry Magazine, the American Poetry Review in mm -hmm. The New Yorker? Mm -hmm. uh, but Kanj, the last poems of Chanja, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, that was an effort to find out what, what would be a very, very old poetry and it assumed it would be largely love poetry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Why do you think our culture shifted away from say love poetry? I have, I have no idea. Uh, I mean, I can speculate in the way that, well, maybe it's this and then 30 seconds later, I realize I'm, I'm wrong about it. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's interesting that just take San Francisco alone, which has been a literary hub since the gold rush. Uh, Bret Hart founded the Overland Monthly. Um, uh, Gillette Burgess founded The Lark, a literary mm -hmm. magazine mm -hmm. in 1895. I never saw a purple cow. I hope I'll never see one, but I will tell you anyhow, I'd rather see than be one. 70% of Americans knew that poem and about half of Americans knew it by heart by 1900. Um, but why is life poetry out of fashion? I don't know. Why is love poetry? Uh, to come back to San Francisco, there was a poet here when I was uh, young and into my college years here named Rod McEwen. And he wrote love poems. And the two, two titles that come readily to mind are Listen to the Warm and Stanion Street and Other Sorrows. And these were wildly successful, as I remember. All bookstores carried them. It went into 16th, 18th, 20th printings. The guy made money off this poetry. He also was a musician and a songwriter and so forth. But I remember... You know, my English teachers in college, Rod McEwen, that's not poetry. That's, I don't know what that is, but that's just, but, but the academy was trying to diminish this, even though it was, it was so popular. And so mm -hmm. if you liked it, you were sneered at by the academy. And if you wanted to become a sophisticate, you had to get your liking for Rod McEwen's type of poetry out. And maybe the same thing happened with light verse, which like left poetry has been around since poetry has been around. Let's turn a little bit to this new book uh, and I'll hold it up. I hope people can see it. It's kind of fading. Anyway, there it is. And um, A Child's Christmas in San Francisco. And it has, it's chock full of light verse and it's beautiful. And it's, uh, you've had, two um, heavyweights in the poetry world come out and say 
really great things about the book. Uh, Joe Parisi, the former editor of Poetry Magazine, called it a big hearted charmer of a book. Uh, uh, Robert Haas, the former US Poet Laureate, uh, called it handsome, fiending, fiendishly ingenious. And these are uh, uh, wonderful words for um, uh, this kind of poetry that uh, uh, many uh, uh, are not paying attention to. So um, you're, you're, you're getting some attention uh, among heavyweights. So that's, that's really wonderful and they have great things to say. Um, what, what was the genesis of this book, John? I think uh, maybe the exodus is more important. How do I, how do I escape this? But the genesis, um, Ralph, was nothing more than the same imagination that goes into, you know, a great, not that this is great, but, but that the same imagination that prompts a sculptor to create something and you're not quite sure what it is mm. uh, or a painting or, or what have you. The genesis literally was recalling one day, I think at the office, it was a Tuesday and I'm walking through the office and somebody said, happy Tuesday. And I turned to the person and I growled, this is a much younger person and I growled, Tuesday is Red's Tamale Day. And that person just looked at me shocked. Like, what did you say? And I said, no, no, you understand. Way back when, in the last millennium, there was a radio station in San Francisco that everybody listened to. Nobody listened to any other one. It was KSFO. It had the great Don Sherwood, um, Jasbo Collins, and so forth. But these commercials would run on the air, and you'd hear this absolutely memorable voice. Mm. that would say, Tuesday is Red's Tamale Day. Well, Red's Tamales were a pre-packaged, I think they were frozen, tamale. And they were advertised all over San Francisco. I mean, you just couldn't escape that. And there was something so memorable about that voice. I later learned that voice, and you can YouTube it or whatever, that voice was the voice of Mel Blank. Ah. The voice of Daffy Duck. Porky Pig, Bugs Bunny, on and on, all the, all the Warner Brothers voices, see? The voice of Farms and Berkeley? That's, that's Mel Blanc, too. And there was just something memorable about it, because at the playground or at school, if it was Tuesday, we would say, Tuesday is what's the Molly Day, see? Mm. <clears throat> and then poems got made up about it or I made up the fact that poems were made up about it. I'm not really sure at this point <laughs> where the uh, creativity uh, leaves off and the memory um, resumes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, um, memory, you know, shaping this book as kind of uh, the child's Christmas in San Francisco, um, you, uh, there's a lot of great writing, uh, and I guess the title is related to Dylan Thomas's uh, work, uh, Child's Christmas in Wales, is that right? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm shameless about this. Uh, uh, Dylan Thomas, the great Welsh poet, uh, wrote, talk about a charmer of a story. It is just a heartbreak and a charmer of a story, mm. a child's Christmas in Wales. And I will confess that the sound of that title, you know, was in my head. And I have to say that Dylan Thomas's wife's name was Caitlin, and your wife was named for Caitlin Thomas. True. Uh, so there's a connection here. There's a, there's mm -hmm. a connection here. Um, but yes, but this book is nothing like A Child's Christmas in Wales, except that there's a lot of fancy in it, a lot of whimsy, um, some memory, and some a lot of imagination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what uh, 
you know, memory seems to me, it plays a big role. I read the book not once, not twice, but three times now in the past 48 hours I've had it. Uh, I, I really uh, am enchanted with the book. I find that, uh, you know, every time I read through it, there's something that I see anew and that might just be a fraction of myself, but I think it's just a, a, a clever and, and, and thought provoking book. But one of the things that um, I find myself wondering about is kind of uh, how you're able to, in my mind, capture some of the essence of San Francisco. And I'm wondering uh, if that's something you sought out to do or if you think that's, that's right. And if so, how you would uh, think about, you know, what is the essence of San Francisco that you capture? I think there is no one essence of San Francisco. It has many essences, which is mm -hmm. one of the charming things, the maddening things, the beguiling things, the enchanting mm -hmm. things about this city. Nobody writes about Fresno as they write about San Francisco. I mean, mm. um, William Saroyan came closest, but where did he, what did he do? He moved to San Francisco. <laughs> it's, it, it, it's ineffable, a word I love. Not sure I exactly know what it means, but it's something mm. like indescribable, ineffable, ineffable. And I, was grasping for a whole bunch of things here. Um, the history of food and drink in San Francisco and not highbrow food mm -hmm. or drink. I mean, mm -hmm. bullpup enchiladas, bullpup yeah. tacos, the it's it at yeah. Playland. Um, Red's tamales, no, but Roosevelt's tamales mm -hmm. or tortolas or what have you. Mm -hmm. I mean, this mm -hmm. is not, oop. Oh, cuisine <laughs> this mm -hmm. is just this is peasant food this is ordinary mm -hmm. food but it mm -hmm. was so san francisco and the school children are very inventive and they do they do ditties they haven't been yet told that light verse is wrong right i mean kids mm -hmm. make up dirty lyrics to songs yeah. they just do yeah or funny lyrics you know not necessarily yeah. dirty but they go into dirty and I got into my share of trouble. <laughs> That's what kids do. Yeah. So, and what do the adults drink? Martinis. Mm -hmm. You know? So it had to be in here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that great couple, Gino and Esther, you know, the Italian kid who went to Galileo and the Jewish girl from the Mission District, who, of course, went to Lowell, you know, and they were the, they were the masters. They had the greatest Monday poem forever. But when they broke up, one long night's walking ocean beach, they vowed they would never ever recite that poem again and only they could do it. Nobody else could remember it and it's lost for the ages. Oh, <laughs> tragic. No, oh, it is. There's some tragic heart. stuff in here. <laughs> it is, it's what breaks my heart. I mean, you know. Um. I remember uh, at, when I was at Mechanics Institute, I learned a little bit about Pisco Punch and <laughs> Pisco Punch plays uh, a, a prominent role in, uh, in the book. And I'm wondering if you could talk about it. I think uh, Saturday is of course Pisco Punch Day. And um, there's a wonderful photo uh, in the book of the house of Pisco. Um, that's kind of hard to come through, but it's, it's, it's a beautiful photo and there's so many great photos in the book, but I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about Pisco and Pisco Day and, and maybe the Diddy. Okay, well, Pisco finds its way, Pisco is a Peruvian brandy, and at Duncan Nichols Bank Exchange Saloon in the Montgomery block, which that's the um, Transamerica Pyramid today, I believe. Mm -hmm. I, believe. It is, yeah. I, I, should, I should know. But in any event, it was served there 
<clears throat> the recipe has disappeared and it's taken on mythic proportions. What was Pisco Punch? And there are so many marvels. I had to actually cut a lot of historical references to Pisco Punch. But the manager of this huge block long building where the saloon was, Oliver Perry Stidger, Stidger likened Pisco, Pisco Punch, quote, to the scimitar of Harun, whose edge was so fine that after a slash, a man walked on unaware that his head had been severed from his body until his knees gave way and he fell to the ground dead. Now that's something to write about. <laughs> and or, and many, or, many people have. Or experience. Or experience. <laughs> uh, there's, and there's a whole the, the long article written in the California Historical uh, Society's journal in the 40 years ago about the, the secrets of Pisco Punch. Only in San Francisco do we think about stuff like this. Only in San Francisco. <laughs> My mm -hmm. gosh, mm -hmm. it's a bit like, where did Drake land? Yeah. yeah. I mean, millions and millions of research hours have been spent on that. <clears throat> Obviously, he landed at Drake's Bay. I mean, it's called Drake's Bay. <laughs> Isn't that where he landed? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Listen, you, you dedicated the book to Warren Hinkle, and I know uh, you were good friends uh, with Warren Hinkle, and and... Uh, why did you dedicate this book to him? And, and maybe you can tell us a little bit about what he meant to you, uh, to writing and to San Francisco. Well, Warren was a dear friend uh, and I miss him greatly. He died in August of uh, uh, 2016. Uh, he was ahead of me at college. He went to USF, the University of San Francisco as distinguished from the University of South Florida, I was appalled to learn that some other upstart school had the same initials. And he was legendary. He took the little college newspaper there and made it one of the finest instruments of journalism in the world. The USF Foghorn became famous. He was a phenomenal writer. He had gone to Reardon High School when he was uh, the senior and the editor of the Foghorn, uh, senior, maybe junior, a young freshman uh, from St. Ignatius, well, from an orphanage who then got into St. Ignatius, is at USF and comes in and he wants to be a reporter for the Foghorn. So he has to interview with Warren Hinkle, the great one. And this fellow, bow tie, sport coat. He shows some writing samples to Hinkle. And Hinkle says, after about 20 minutes of this, he said, that, well, it's, it's 1130. You've passed the office portion of the interview. Now it's off for the remainder of it. Well, what's that? Asked the young student. We're hitting the bars in North Beach. The young student was Kevin Starr. Those two became the closest of friends the greatest historian of California ever, Kevin, and the wildest writer since when? We've had a lot of wild writers in, in California, in San Francisco. Uh, Warren went on to a great career. Hunter S. Thompson, we wouldn't know of Hunter S. Thompson if it weren't for Warren. He was a discoverer of talent. He assigned Hunter S. Thompson to cover the 1970 Kentucky Derby. That story, 50 years old now, that story is considered one of the four or five best sports stories ever written in the 20th century. Now, Hinkle was a fabulous editor and no one will ever know how much of that story was actually Hinkle as opposed to Thompson. And ESPN has an interview with uh, Warren, maybe 10 years before his death, about 
wresting that story out of Thompson, getting it, mm-hmm. okay? Forcing him to write. They kidnapped him in a hotel room in New York, and it's a fabulous mm-hmm. story. But Hinkle valued writing, valued good writing, valued writing for a purpose, and valued writing really well for fun. Mm-hmm. And I admired him so much for all of this. Martini Monday, the, the story uh, that's there is in part, in large part, lifted from an essay that he asked me to write a number of years ago. Typical Hinkle called me up. John, John, I need you to do me a favor. And I said, oh, no, you haven't gotten behind the wheel of a car, have you? (laughs) He was known to have a drink or two. Yeah. No, 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 I want you to write me a story. And it was the story of the the true story of the birth of the martini. Then I thought, okay, I've got three or four months. He said, no, 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 I need it Friday. I said, this is Wednesday. (laughs) And uh, I did it. I did it. and uh, th- it was great fun. So the, the story there in the book is 99% historical fact and 1% BS. Nice. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll leave the readers to guess which 1% is the BS. <laughs> so uh, just staying with the, the Hinkle connection, uh, this is published by Last Gas Press which is a wonderful San Francisco house, uh, publishers of the weird and wonderful. How, how did you get uh, connected with, with last gasp and, and, and how did you decide uh, that they were a good fit for this book? Well, as to your last question, it might be turned the other way around. How did they decide that this book would be a good fit for Mm -hmm. their esteemed publishing house? But uh, Ron Turner founded last gasp. 50 years ago this year. Um, his son, Colin, is doing a lot of the heavy, heavy lifting today. Mm-hmm. And they're friends. Uh, Ron was a great friend of Warren Hinkle's mm-hmm. uh, and of the whole writing and publishing community in, in San Francisco. He's a marvelous, warm-hearted fellow. And uh, I can't quite remember I mean, when he asked, when we got serious about this, he said, What's, uh, what genre is this manuscript of yours? And I said, well, I, it, it, it has no known genre. I don't, I, I don't know. <clears throat> it's not, anyway, what, you know, you look at all these pigeonholes, and I can't fit this thing into anyone. Yeah. Well, how would you describe it? I said, uh, it's a nostalgia for a time that never was, probably. Mm. Uh, but we we talked about it, and they do they publish a lot of weird stuff. The comics are, are classic. I mean, they're one of the great publishers in the world in that field. Mm-hmm. But they also published Hinkle's posthumous "Who Killed Hunter S. Thompson?" Question mark. I mean, what a provocative title, because mm-hmm. you don't have to look far. Hunter S. Thompson killed himself. Mm-hmm. But the, que- the mere posing of the question asks so many things. This book is a 250, 60 page introduction by Warren about his good friend, Hunter S. Thompson. And then essays from 30, 40 other people about Thompson, including then Governor Jerry Brown. And it's a it's a, a, a absolutely astounding exploration of a literary phenomenon. It's not just Thompson; it's mm-hmm. also Hinkle and the whole the whole circle that is all mm-hmm. gone now. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm I feel very honored to mm-hmm. have this book brought out by Last Gasp, uh, particularly in light of not only their 50 years but that particular book. Who killed mm-hmm. Hunter S. Thompson? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, it seems like a, a, a perfect marriage, uh, and I, I, I think you know not only is the the writing, uh, you know, it's 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 really poignant, uh, provocative, uh, uh, 
filled with feeling, but I think it's also a, a, a beautiful book in the way it's laid out. Um, and I think the image that's images that were selected are, are amazing. Can you talk a little bit about some of those images? Yes, and I have to doff my hat to my editor and the designer, Tom mm -hmm. Christensen, who I hope is listening. Um, Tom is a remarkable fellow. Uh, we've been friends for six or seven years. He edited and designed The Lost Poems of Chanchia mm. uh, for me. Uh, Tom uh, has a PhD in comparative lit, as I remember, from the University of Wisconsin. So, I mean, he's deeply mm -hmm. into literature. He was the number two person at North Point Press, ran Mercury House for 10 years, and then for 17 years was the uh, publications director at the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco. So think of all those magnificent coffee table books and, and mm -hmm. whatnot. But he's also a translator of poetry, of latter 20th century Spanish poetry. Mm -hmm. And if you liked Laura Esquivel's Like Water for Chocolate, you can thank Tom. He's the translator of that. Oh, beautiful. But he read the manuscript and he asked if he could do the design working with Last Gasp. So the dust jacket, which is very arresting and is very deliberately mm -hmm. not green and red, mm -hmm. you know, the hues are, are not, but he found a very, very old postcard, which is, well, it's no older than 1937 because of the Bay Bridge, all right, or mm -hmm. 1936. Um, but you can tell by the buildings in the background, he superimposed Santa and the sled. Nice. Um, and, and he laid it out, he came up with the size, the, um, uh, he selected the photographs, Mm -hmm. which are marvelous and laid everything out. Um, I should give a shout out to Boudin Bakery because uh, Wednesday is sourdough day and that's uh, Papa Stefano Girardo um, on page uh, 12 that Boudin allowed, you know, so that's, that's a real, you know, Papa Stefano was the head baker at Boudin Bakery and that's him with those loves. So well, you got just some amazing characters in here. I, uh, speaking of amazing characters, uh, Mechanics Institute is filled with them and they usually come up with uh, just wonderful questions. So uh, what I'd like to do at this moment is turn it over to Taryn and Kimberly and uh, maybe they have some questions uh, to, to fire at you. Yes, speaking of characters, uh, <laughs> let's go back to Warren Hinkle. Um, and Cynthia has a question for you, John. How were you able to beat uh, Warren Hinkle from being the first to write A Child's Christmas in San Francisco? Did you have a conversation about these poems? <laughs> yeah, we had, yes, we had, we had many conversations about all such things, and Warren just uh, sadly died before me. Otherwise, I'm sure he would have written a much better book than this. So lots of uh, calamari-fueled lunches at Sam's? Well, yeah, kind of calamari, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> we pretended every day was Monday, which meant it was uh, martini day. So we had a, we had a martini for... Uh, um, in honor of, of Hinkle, um, I have my, my glass here, which is empty. I've been abs abstaining on all during this presentation. Uh, but yes, we had, we formed what we call the Warren Hinkle Roundtable at Sam's. And uh, Taryn, you've sat there at that table. It's, it started at that round table in the corner. It was named by Kevin Starr, uh, but we had... Uh, uh, there, were, there were dinners, and we talked about San Francisco history, about the importance of history, the importance of literacy, the importance of poetry. How do we impart it to the next generation? The importance of fun in it all, because if it isn't fun, it's not going to take. And so that's one of the reasons that I dedicated this to Warren, because he was all about, you got to make it fun. You got to 
really tickle the reader or the student or the child. Great answer. I didn't know that that round table in the corner was was named for him. Well, that when we had, yeah, it was the poor man's uh, round table from the Algonquin Hotel. And it was named by Kevin Starr. Um, uh, I mean, Hinkle, when he was there, he was always uh, and he was always there until he got very sick and then he died. He was our chair uh, and included people uh, like uh, Jim Haas, uh, Charles Frakia, Charles Fallhaber from Berkeley, uh, you know, many people, uh, Lawrence Ferlinghetti. Uh, and uh, when Hinkle got sick and then died, Kevin became Kevin Starr, the great historian, became our chair. Uh, but Kevin died uh, only five months later, uh, January of uh, 2017. And then Ernie Bile, great North Beach flaneur, as he called himself, uh, six foot six. <laughs> That's a great word. I love that word. But and Ernie wrote a column for the, he, he had been a chronicle writer. Um, he wrote a column for the Marina Times. He became our uh, chair. And then Ernie died on his 90th birthday. And so we don't have chairs anymore because when you're named chair, you, you're going to die soon, it seems like. <laughs> so there was another question from Cynthia Murray, and it just said, what was your... Uh, favorite Christmas poem as a child, John? My, oh my gosh. I know a Cynthia Murray and God help her if this is the same Cynthia Murray who has tough, but my favorite Christmas poem as a child. I, I'm not sure I had one. I, that's a very disappointing answer to me, especially, but I, None pops into my head. <clears throat> now, John, what are you doing to make sure that uh, that the literary and historical traditions of San Francisco carry on other than writing books and maybe <laughs> hosting lunches at Sam's? Well, <clears throat> as you know, I like to support the Mechanics Institute and all that it does to support the literary institutions. Uh, and at the San Francisco Historical Society, where I'm the I'm lucky enough to be the president now. When we reopen, we have this marvelous museum at 608 Commercial Street, where we've already had literary events until we were, we only got the museum last August. Uh, but it's, I, how, how can we do it? Incidentally, that museum, that building, 608 Commercial Street, that was the first mint west of the Mississippi. It became a United States mint. And Bret Hart uh, was hired, I believe, as the superintendent of the Mint with a nice budget. What did Bret Hart do as the superintendent of the Mint? He founded the Overland Monthly, a fabulous literary magazine right there. I think he spent all his time on that. You look at volume one, 1868, I want to say, the year before the Transcontinental Railroad was completed. And you read, <clears throat> he has um, uh, poems by Ina Kulbreth. She was the first poet laureate of California. A guy named Mark Twain writes all of these stories. The celebrated jump, jumping frog of Calaveras County. Bret Hart, The Luck of Roaring Camp, and so many other great West Coast writers found it right there. Um, all people who came from someplace else. They weren't native San Franciscans because they were the Ohlones and <laughs> they actually weren't uh, welcomed into this new society that, that had come here. But I hope to do my part in the remainder of my life to foster a love and enjoyment of literature. Doing great so far. <laughs> providing your own. Thank, thank you. <laughs> thank you. There's another question. So what do you view as the most magical place in San Francisco during the Christmas season? Uh, 
there are, there are <laughs> oh, Kimberly, there are too many magical places in San Francisco, but I, if it's, if I've got to pick one, it's Land's End, um, where there's the remains of the bridge of uh, USS San Francisco, um, or Little Sutro Park that hardly anybody knows of that overlooks the Cliff House. These are magical places. Yeah, Little Sutro is a very beautiful place. Yes. So what, there's a question from Will, what is your next book? Do you have anything in the hopper? Well, I've got, <laughs> I've got two. I've got a, a book of serious poetry. I've got three. A book of serious poetry. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I don't know what the working title is, maybe Cold Coffee. A, uh, another book of light verse called, um, <clears throat> well, it has three super titles and then a title, um, uh, but let's just call it Fish Feathers. It's too, too complicated, but it's light verse. It's poems about animals with names beginning with each letter of the alphabet. It's been done many, many times by other people. Uh, but, but I've been practicing law for going on 49 years and I have a lot of reflections on it. I've been very fortunate to have had some fascinating cases and more fortunate to have met some phenomenal people in the law. And so I'm working on a book titled, tentatively titled Paper Lawyer, Confessions of a Practicer of the Dark Arts of Law. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you need to wear a robe with that. <laughs> I was curious. I, I noticed, you know, reading the book, which was great, you know, you did it by each day and I, you know, started on a Tuesday, which I thought was really unique. But I really liked when I got to Thursday and there's this great photo of a roller coaster from Playland. And um, you know, really appreciate the whimsy and sort of tying it to food and was just curious, sort of how do you see the, you know, pre-depression era of large amusement parks like Playland and, you know, places like Coney Island and Neptune Beach and how these helped maybe create and maybe shift when they close sort of some of the culture and experiences of San Francisco. That's a, that's a phenomenal question, Kimberly, and I, I don't have a ready answer to it. I. Your, your answer assumes that there was a cultural shift, and I agree with that. I feel that there was. Yeah. I remember when, when Playland closed. I remember when uh, the fire destroyed Sutro Baths. Mm -hmm. um, and as a young fella, uh, you know, going out to Playland, that was one of those uh, really inexpensive dates. It, I, I don't remember what it cost, but, you know, you could just ride rides and have a lot of laughs, um, eat some so-so <laughs> food. This is a funny, it was probably awful food, but we have such wonderful memories of it. And it was created by the, the surroundings, Laughing Sal. There's a mm -hmm. wonderful photograph of Laughing Sal who reposes at Pier 45 right now. And she was hideous. Why do, why do we all want to go see Laughing Sal? and hear her cackle as she bent forward and back and forward and back. I, it, it had some effect as radio must have had some effect as television. I remember adults saying, well, television is rotting the brains of children. And then later I read that Plato, that Plato railed against writing Writing things down. No, you're going to rot the brain. <laughs> Memorize. <laughs> don't, don't write stuff down. <laughs> he also didn't like poetry, but his student <laughs> Aristotle studied it fervently. <laughs> All right. Now, this is for both you and Ralph, just because uh, you have a, both have a, a long experience with San Francisco food. Now, uh, my father, he worked for the Veterans Administration in the 70s and 80s, and he would always come home after work and he would say, yeah, we had a rat burger for lunch. 
do you know what that could have been? <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea, but I'm dying hmm. to know. <laughs> I don't, Ralph, you, you, your turn. You got to feel this. Boy, you know, I think it's something that one of my sons would try and feed me, but I, I have <laughs> what, what, what that is. I'm sorry, Taryn. I'm drawing a blank. Maybe somebody in the audience has an answer for you. I'll pose it in the chat space. Yeah. <laughs> so John, uh, you know, I think we're coming towards an end. And I just, you know, we're in the middle of this pandemic and, you know, you and, and Number of your friends and colleagues have done just an amazing job and and really saving a cultural institution in Sam's Grill and I know it's a really hard time uh, for restaurants in general and I'm sure for Sam's Grill. Uh, um, how are you feeling right now and and uh, about San Francisco and and you know what the future holds. I'm feeling very positive. And I think partly because that's the only feeling you one has to have. You, you, you know, you can't give up hope. But looking at it objectively, you know, San Francisco began as a city in 1849. It nominally began with the mission and the Presidio in 1776, but there was nobody here until the gold rush of 1849. Fewer than 500 people in the census of 1847. In those first couple of years, everything was built of wood <clears throat> and the, the city burned down mm -hmm. six times in two years. Just everything just went through and they, and, and they rebuilt. And how many times have we heard it said, particularly San Francisco is not like what it used to be. Oh, has it changed? And you know, for the worst and everything else. Can you imagine being here then during one of those six fires, but then take 1906. So you have one of the largest earthquakes in an urban area ever. Population of 400,000, 250,000 are homeless almost overnight. 250,000. We got 8,000 homeless in San Francisco today, and that's a crisis. Well, no, wait, 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 wait. We had 250,000 homeless before. We figured out what to do about it. I have no idea how the city is going to climb out. Even more recently, when Organizations like the Mechanics Institute, like the San Francisco Historical Society, relied upon great corporate benefactors such as Chevron, Bank of America, right? They leave San Francisco. They stop writing checks to Mechanics Institute, to the Symphony, the Opera, the Asian Art Museum. So, oh, this is the end. This is the end of culture and arts because we need that private money. But somehow it changed. Now we're, we're in the midst of a disaster. A lot of businesses are not gonna make it. A lot of nonprofits are not gonna make it. It's scary in the nonprofit world. Like you, I, I have one foot in that. You got both feet in that right now. Um, I, I'm, I'm optimistic, but I have no objective reason to be except that people who come to San Francisco, they, you know, they drink the water. And we're just going to do it. Beautiful. Thank you. I mean, it's it's nice to hear that that note of uh, that perspective and that that, that hopefulness. Um, it's it's not always easy in these times. So thank you for that, John. Tara and, I, and Kimberly, I, we have just a few minutes left. I don't know uh, how you'd like to proceed. Well, we have an answer to my rat burger question, which I think is <laughs> kind of fun. <laughs> uh, Cynthia says rat burgers were greasy burgers and also good for hangovers. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I always thought the VA was near the, uh, the Embarcadero. So I always envisioned giant wharf rats. <laughs> oh, the, but, the, v, the VA was uh, Fort Miley out by uh, Sutro. Uh, park. 
No, it had to have been on Bart because he took Bart. Well, you can't you can't take Bart out to the beach. Yeah. <laughs> this, would have, this would have been in the seventies and eighties, so there had to have been okay. some sort of like office yeah. or sp space yeah. or something. But yeah. anyway, hey, I want to thank you both for coming and uh, sharing your sharing your book, sharing a, you know a fun conversation, um, and you know, cheers to a uh, a happier new year. Cheers indeed. Thank you, Taryn and Kimberly and Ralph. Yeah. Thanks Thank to you, you all. Much. And and thanks to Mechanics Institute. And I wish you all a very, very happy holiday season. Stay safe. Be well. Great. Thank you, Likewise. everyone. This has been great. Bye bye. bye. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank we'll you. send the video link out tomorrow. Uh, so you can share it with your friends and family if you like. And don't forget to pick up a copy of A Child's Christmas in San Francisco by John Briscoe. It is a wonderful last minute gift or stocking stuffer for your loved one, for a local or a wannabe local. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thanks again. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Bye. Bye.